Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. I wanted to start the book of Acts again <clears throat> this week, but God kind of stopped me in my tracks Tuesday morning in prayer. And uh, I was praying and God began to give me words and scripture to share with you in prayers. And I started praying for the church and I was praying for my own life, my family. And I realized that God was actually giving me a sermon for today. And so uh, I will start Acts next week and it starts to get really exciting again in the book of Acts in chapter four. And we're studying through that book. Um, but this week I wanna share five prayers for Calvary in 2024. And these words really spoke to me and God was really speaking to me, giving me scripture. And again, I realized I needed to share these with you today. And uh, I will add to this list as I pray for our church and as I pray for our journey. You may find that my list of prayers stimulates or stirs in you different things to pray for as well, or just words that God wants you to use to focus in 2024. I'm praying that this message helps you grow closer to Jesus this year. Amen? Yeah. <clears throat> So number one, let's get right into it. Number one, when I was in prayer this Tuesday morning and throughout the week, God gave me the word purpose. And I'm praying that we live a life of purpose. In, in Luke 19, one through 10, Jesus is in Jericho and he's in a crowd and he's walking down this road and a shorter man by the name of Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to focus in on him and get his attention, so to say, or at least be able to see Jesus. And he goes ahead and he climbs a tree so he can see Jesus. And what's, what's really powerful and interesting in, in Luke 19, one through 10, is that Jesus sees him. In a large crowd, Jesus sees you. In a large church or in a large world, Jesus sees you, just so you know. Isn't that encouraging? Amen. And Jesus saw him and Jesus actually invites himself over to his house. I guess that's what Jesus can do, you know? Yeah. And Jesus says, I will be a guest in your house today. Now, everyone's upset that Jesus is talking to this guy, the, the crowd, they're being judgmental because he's a notorious sinner, he's a tax collector, and he was known for extorting people all their money and taking more than what he's supposed to take for Rome. And he was a Jew. And so the Jewish people did not like how their own people were working for Rome. And then on top of that, Zacchaeus was taking a little bit more for himself and demanding more than what Rome was asking for. So they were upset and they were thinking, I can't believe Jesus is hanging out with him. And when Jesus is at his house, he says, uh, Zacchaeus says, I will give back anything I've taken. I will give fourfold back. I will make things right, in other words, and I'm paraphrasing for us. And Jesus says, salvation has come to this home. And he says these famous words, for I have come to seek and to save the lost. Why am I saying this? Because Jesus knew his purpose in life. Jesus was born to save sinners. His name meant to save his people from their sin. Jesus came and he lived a perfect life and died a life for us so that we could be saved. He trained up his disciples so they could help other people become believers. Jesus lived a life of purpose. In Ephesians 2.10 says this, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. In other words, when we have been saved, we are a new creation in Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. <clears throat> Now, in the NIV, it says what he prepared in advance for us. So Jesus died for you, and on purpose, he died for you, and now you have a purpose in him. You are people of purpose. Can you say amen? amen. It's time to wake up. Are we awake? Amen. All right, let's go. Listen, you, my friend, are a people of purpose. The devil doesn't want you to think that. But the Christian life is not one that's meaningless or without purpose. The Christian life has purpose. Think about this for a moment. The only person or the only way we know who we're supposed to be is the person of Jesus Christ. The only way we know who we're truly meant to be is Jesus. 
The only things that we're meant to do, the, how do we know what we're really supposed to do in this life? It's found in Jesus. How do we know where we're headed? It's found in Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, the Christian life and following Jesus is not one of spontaneity and luck and happenstance or, you know, I'll play it by ear today and see what I'm supposed to do. No, you have purpose and focus. You have been given that. Even in the mundane things of life, he gives you purpose. Moms, you have purpose. Dads, you have purpose. Marriages, you have purpose. Families, you have purpose. Bosses, employees, coworkers, you have purpose. You know, you remember when we used to have toll booths with people inside them? No, I mean, if you were in them, praise God, you were there, right? Well, people might have thought, I don't have purpose sitting in this booth. Even that person has purpose. God gives everyone purpose. What is your purpose? Why did he save you? Gee, this is what Paul said. I, I strive to find out why he took a hold of me. Why did Jesus take a hold of me? Paul wanted to know, why did Jesus take a hold of me? Why did Jesus take a hold of you? There is purpose in your life and the devil wants to do everything to keep you from that purpose. And here's how we know our purpose. We know it by knowing our creator. You need to know God and you'll know your purpose. You need to know his will. And then you need to make him known to everyone around you. You have purpose at home. You have purpose at work. You have purpose in this church and in this community. Do me a favor and begin to think your life in the kingdom mindset. Put on kingdom lenses, okay? I'm a mechanic, but what am I in the kingdom as I'm a mechanic? I'm a doctor or nurse, I'm a teacher, I'm a mom or dad, whatever it may be, put on the kingdom lenses, what are you supposed to do? Students in high school, middle school, college, Yes, you are a student, but in kingdom mindset, what are you? You're a disciple of Jesus Christ. You're a Christian, you're a follower of Christ. You know, there are full-time pastors and there are full-time missionaries and there's full-time leaders, but the majority of Christians are not those things. The majority of Christians are, are in many different careers in many different fields. Here's why, um, and this is important. God, God wants you to know that you're valuable in all those roles because the majority of us are not full-time in ministry, but we're all full-time Christians. Can I get an amen? amen? We're all supposed to be full-time Christians, full-time disciples, no matter what role we're in. I need you where you are. And you may say, you need me where I am. Well, I, we gotta work together, praise the Lord. And we gotta know our purpose. And I'm praying this year you will know your purpose and the only way you're gonna know it is when you know Jesus Christ because he is who you're supposed to be, what you're supposed to do and where you are headed. Jesus gives us purpose. So today, if you're feeling like uh, my life is meaningless, that is not the truth. That's a lie. Your life is full of meaning. You have purpose. It is found though in Christ and nowhere else. It's found in God and his word. Here's another word that God gave me in my prayer time and just for this year is the word abide or to remain in fellowship with Jesus, to, to have spiritual fellowship with him. I'm praying we will experience God's presence in greater measure. I'm not saying I want you to have a lot of time with God. How, how long can you read the Bible? Put a badge on your chest. I did great. I read an hour long. I'm not saying that. Let's just go ahead and throw that out the window, okay? How long did you pray? We're not trying to say that. What we want is for you to have a greater, and I'm, I'm praying that you have a greater measure of God's presence in your life. That you experience God like you've never experienced him before when you hang out with him, whether it's a short amount of time or a long time or throughout the day, I'm praying that when you abide in him and you fellowship with him, you experience his presence in greater measure. John 15, four through five says this, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. True, right? And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. So do you wanna be productive for the Lord? 
Do you want to have a greater uh, relationship with the Lord? Well, it doesn't start by being away from him. It starts by being with him. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. Now, obviously, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. He's talking about kingdom work. He's talking about spiritual work, all right, and spiritual life. Now, do we need Jesus for all areas of life? Absolutely. Do we have God's help to get up in the morning and give us strength? Absolutely. He's given us that natural ability. But to do the work of God, you're going to need Jesus Christ. To be a godly parent, to be a godly coworker, a godly boss, a person in the church who serves, you're going to need Jesus Christ. Apart from him, you can do nothing. Apart from him, we cannot grow and become more like Jesus. Isn't that the truth, though? If he's the life source, we can't. In a, in a, in a world of a get, it, get things done kind of world, in a, in a personality, that, that personality that just wants to get things done, Sometimes we can think that slowing down to be with the Lord, reading our Bibles and praying is counterproductive. Sometimes we can think that. The reality is it's the most productive thing you can do. Because apart from Jesus, you won't accomplish what you need to accomplish. The most productive thing you could do is to abide, to remain in him, to fellowship, to stay in his presence and to let him feed you life. And let me tell you this, God wants more than your reading plan. God wants more than your perfect record of reading the Bible and praying and coming to church. You know what God wants? God wants your heart and my heart. He wants that. God wants your heart even before your hands and your feet. Here's why. Because when we have, when we know God's will, we know God's heart, we'll know what to do. And we'll do the right things. When we know God's heart, we'll make the right next decision. Amen. When, we, when God has our heart, he'll lead and guide us. He'll steer us. He'll produce in us what we need to do and who we are supposed to be. He wants your heart even before your hands and your feet. So abide this year. Fellowship with him. Now, how do we do that? Let me give you two that we all know. It's reading the Bible and praying, right? Amen. Reading the Bible and praying. Now, listen to what... Uh, some, some smart men of God have said, Oswald Chambers said, prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. Let me explain that. Sometimes we pray so that we can be ready. Sometimes we pray so that we can get something from God. Prayer is what we need to do with God. Amen. Prayer is what our souls and our spirit need is prayer. A lot of times we pray to get somewhere or to get something done, but it's being with God that is the greater work. Amen. Let me keep going though to help us understand. Martin Luther, he said this, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. Oh, wait a second, that's a, that's, that's a long time to pray. And he's not saying that's what we all have to do. That's, this is what he did. What he's saying is, <clears throat> that the work that's important right now is prayer and being with God, not getting to my to-do list. It's slowing down and being with the Lord. And whether that's 10 minutes, 30 minutes to three hours, that's what, that's what needs to happen. And what's interesting is, is Martin Luther also said this another time, when he was praying, he saw his friend in the fields needing help, so he stopped praying to go help. So it's not about just always praying and that's the work you're supposed to do. You eventually are supposed to go do God's will on earth. Amen? Amen. So praise the Lord for prayer, but also go do what God says to do. And then Charles Spurgeon says this, <clears throat> a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. Now, don't go home and be like, all right, let me make this look bad. You know? <laughs> let, me, let me wear this out. <laughs> no, I mean, when, when we, yeah, your, your Bible's going to take a beating a little bit. You know, it's going to have stains from your fingers or you might get a little coffee ring on it. You know, when you put your coffee cup on accidentally or something, it's going to get worn down because you use it, but your life won't be worn out or worn down. You're not going to fall apart. These things are so important. And I'm praying this year that we will abide in him. And there's a reason why. 
And I, 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 I quoted three famous pastors. Can I give you a quote? I'm not famous, but can I give you a quote? <clears throat> it is not in the doing of these things that you transform. It is God at work in you as you do them that transforms you. That's so important to understand. I've had to learn this over the years that it's not me getting my to-do list with God done. It's God doing his work in me as I do those things. As I'm obeying Christ and as I'm obeying, he says, remain in me. So as I fellowship with Jesus and I may not even see what he's doing, I won't even feel it all the time, but he's giving me life and he's speaking to me and he's nourishing my body, my soul and my spirit. He's giving me words for later. In fact, let me tell you what happened this week. <clears throat> I was reading this scripture, studying for this week, for Sunday, today, and I, I read that apart from me, you can do nothing. And God gave me something to say, and I was gonna like post it on Facebook, but I held it to myself. And then I end up getting uh, a need that came my way for a man going through some, some stuff in his life. And this is the word that God gave me. If you've been trying to improve your life or improve your marriage or, or fix something going on in your life and you haven't done it with Jesus, start again. And guess what I did? When this need came across my phone, I said what I felt I was supposed to say. Try again, but this time with Jesus. Amen. Now here's the struggle when it involves someone else who doesn't want to try with Jesus, okay? But you have to not let that keep you from leaning on Jesus and doing it the way Jesus says to do. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Don't try to fix that situation. Don't try on your own strength. In fact, when we were singing this, this song, uh, Firm Foundation, and we, we sang the words, I, I can't do this on my own strength, I believe. I can't remember the line but I won't do this on my own strength. I never noticed that line in that song, that I can't do this on my own strength. I won't do this on my own strength. You cannot change your life and be the person Christ has called you to be on your own strength. You must abide in Jesus and draw from the vine and let him give you life. Can I get an amen in order to do that? <clears throat> And look, if you're, if you're about to quit on the, on the faith, uh, quit on God, try with Jesus first, not your own power or your own strength. Okay, start with Jesus again. If, you're, if your marriage is about to collapse, can you start over one more time, but this time lean in on Jesus? I don't know, you apply that to all the different places of your life. Try again, this time with Jesus. Remember Galatians 2.20, Paul said this, it is not I who live, but Christ in me. Amen. You see, if we're gonna live this life, we're gonna need Christ living in us first and living through us and living out of us. And the only way you can do that is if you connect to the true vine, which is Jesus Christ. So this year, I'm praying that we will abide in him and have a greater measure of his presence in our lives. Thirdly, ooh, this one's tough, trust. Trust. I'm praying we have a steadfast trust in God. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart, not part of it, all, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him or acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. How many know that you can't figure God out? And things happen that you just don't understand. And that's because we try to understand from our own understanding. We lean on our own understanding instead of leaning on that God's doing something, that God is working, that God has a plan. That's where that intersection of trust comes in, where you got to learn to trust the Lord for the next step or to wait and see what he's doing. <clears throat> when you look back at the Old Testament and you look at the life of the Israelites and God and their relationship, God preserved, protected, and even multiplied the Israelites. You ready for this? While they were enslaved in Egypt. While they were going through trials and crying out for deliverance, first of all, God delivers them, praise the Lord. He brings them out of that trial. He brings them out of that enslavement, okay? But in the midst of it, they still thrived. Wow. 
that God can work even in those difficult seasons where you're trapped or you're stuck and you can still thrive. That's our God, amen? But then he's, he's hearing their cries and so he sends a leader to get them out and miracles to get them out and they get out and they're in the desert. They don't get to the promised land right away. They gotta go through a desert. They gotta go through a wilderness journey and God shows up again and again. He makes a way where there is no way through the Red Sea. And then when they're thirsty, he gives them water from a rock. And then when they're hungry, he sends birds and manna from the sky. God knows how to provide for you. God knows how to protect you. God knows how to work for you, for your good and on your behalf. He is working things out you never even knew he was doing. I'm telling you, you probably learned some lessons in 2023 that tell you you can trust God in 2024. Amen. Amen. Can you believe it's even 2024 already? I signed a paper 2023 this past week. I made a mistake. I was like, it's 2024. But you've learned, you've learned that he's trustworthy. You've learned that he's gonna take care of you. He's gonna work things out. Just so you know, 2024 will test you. Maybe you've already been tested. It doesn't take long. It's just a day and the clock goes over and it's just another day. January 1st, 2024 is another day like any other day, right? And life goes on and it's either going to be life or people or even God will test your faith. Even God will test your trust. Why? Not to destroy you or to hurt you, but to strengthen you and show you his faithfulness. Like, I got you. You just need to trust me. You're going to go through this so I can teach you how trustworthy I am. That's the kind of thing that God does. His ways are not our ways. Lean not on our own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. Okay, even in the difficult times, submit to him. And he will make your paths straight. Eventually, the Israelites got to the promised land. Eventually, we will have the promised land, the eternal life. God's working out our paths. Fourth, the fourth word that God gave me, I'm gonna keep moving forward. Again, let these speak to you, let them encourage you. You can trust God, by the way, with your family. Yes. Let me, hold, yeah, let me go back a little bit. Because this in the first service, God had me punch this in a little bit more. Um, trust God with your family. Trust God with your future. Woo-hoo. Trust God with your finances. Trust God with your career, with where you're supposed to go next. What are you supposed to do? Trust God with, you know, where do you find, where do you worship for a church? Trust God. Let him lead and guide you. He knows what he's doing, doesn't he? You might be really good at directions. You may be able to use, without a GPS, you could probably get across the whole, uh, the whole country. That's awesome. But when it comes to life, Nah, we can't figure that out without trusting God. There's just no way. I encourage you to trust the Lord. So fourthly, God gave me the word boldness. Boldness. I'm praying we will be bold witnesses of the gospel, of the good news of Jesus Christ. Romans 1, 16 through 17 says, for I am not ashamed of this good news or the gospel about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes It's not gimmicks that save people. It's not your really good persuasive speeches that get people saved. It's not Pastor Ryan's sermons that get people saved. It's the gospel in your message that is the power to save. We can be bold about the good news of Jesus Christ. The bad news is sin leads to death. The good news is Jesus leads to eternal life. That sounds good. Eternal death or eternal life. I don't know. I think I want to be bold about people having eternal life. And I think they would want that too. Amen. The world is bold. Isn't the world bold? Oh my goodness. We wear it on shirts and we're flagrant with it on our social media accounts and on the news and in life. The world is bold about their worldly ways. Where are the Christians being bold about our faith in the good news of Jesus Christ? Let us rise up. Let us rise up and be bold. Now, boldness doesn't mean judgmental. Boldness doesn't mean weird. 
<laughs> boldness, and how do you define that? That's relative. I'm not weird. That was a little weird. I'm serious. The Holy Spirit's not weird. We're more weird than anything else. Okay? And thank God we can be gracious with each other in those moments and put up with each other and be patient. But listen, Jesus was not weird about things. He wasn't awkward. He might have been confrontive and, and it might have, been, might have been weird to some people, actually. I take that back. Maybe he was. Maybe some things he said were odd. Right? But he never pressured people to believe. He never judged people to the point that, you know, he was judgmental to get them to believe. He never tried to finagle someone or use gimmicks or things to get people to believe. He just loved them. He told them the truth. He gave them an invitation. He walked away. That's Jesus. You know, we don't force people to believe and we don't force people to accept the good news of Jesus Christ. It is a choice to trust in the Lord and believe or not. So in the process of us being bold, it doesn't mean we're belligerent or, or strong or being off color about our faith. That's why the Bible says to be salt and light and salt brings flavor to things and is attractive and the light attracts people to Christ, amen? I don't know about you, but I put salt in my food just a little bit, you know, because <laughs> some things just need salt. Well, the gospel should be, it should be attractive like that. It should be appealing. Okay, and not a turn off to people. So be careful in your boldness that you're not turning people away, amen? And you're gonna need to ask God to help you. But boldness also means this. Let us proclaim and express our faith with conviction clothed in compassion. So be strong, be real, be honest, but do it with compassion at the same time. All right? Let us toss out fearful and doubtful assumptions that people won't listen. Hmm. People aren't going to listen. So I'm not going to say anything. That's a false assumption. Do you think people want to know the truth in life? Some people may not, but a majority of people do. I'm not going to let someone who doesn't want to listen keep me from being quiet. Because those who do want to listen and do want to hear the gospel and who are ready to hear, they're waiting for me to open my mouth. They're waiting for me to show it. So don't let, I, I wrote this down. I don't know if this makes sense yet, but go with me on this. You know how the harvest field is plenty, but the workers are few? And how Jesus says that, it, that the lost are in the field, so to say, and the workers got to go out and bring them in and harvest the field. We, we're in Delaware. We're agricultural kind of state, right? We get it. All right, this is what I wrote. I'm convinced the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are scared off by a few scarecrows in the fields. Does that make sense? I think it makes sense. <laughs> Although the farmer usually puts the, scare, the sca scarecrows there. So. <laughs> but the devil knows how to also deceive. See, don't let a few keep you from telling everyone else the truth because yes. it's good news not bad news it's good news praise the lord okay it worked it worked the illustration worked all right lastly focus this could really have been the title of this whole message i'm praying we will focus on what matters the most even if that means that your focus isn't so much on any of the words i've said or any of the scripture I've given you so far, even though I think they're all Christ-centered, okay? But if God gives you a certain focus this year, you need to focus on it, Amen. all right? And we need to focus on what matters the most. The Bible talks a lot about this. In Matthew 6, after Jesus is talking to them about not worrying about all the stuff in this world, the possessions or treasures, okay? He says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So you're going to need food, you're going to need clothing, you got, you're going to have possessions, but none of those things are the most important things. The most important thing is seeking the kingdom of God and doing his righteous deeds here on earth. That's the most important thing for you to focus on this year. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then all those things will be taken care of. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. I've seen it in my life. Hebrews 12, one through three. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let me explain. 
chapter 11 was all the examples of these heroes of faith in the Old Testament. He's saying, therefore, because we have this crowd of witnesses who've lived the life of faith, be encouraged, so to say, to strip off everything or every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Don't focus on that. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. So don't let sin dominate your life. Throw that stuff off, okay? Sometimes you gotta focus on ridding things from your life so you can focus back on the race following Jesus, all right? And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Praise God, amen. I'm gonna stop there for a moment. Jesus is your focus. You can look in the mirror this, this year. You need to, you know, you, you got to comb my hair, right? <laughs> Brush your hair. We put on makeup, whatever you do. Okay. We're going to do that. But I'm telling you this. Don't look at yourself to help you find out where you're supposed to go this year. Amen. Your mirror is right here. Amen. Jesus is in here. <laughs> Fix your eyes on Jesus. We find Jesus in these pages, not in the mirror. It starts here, it starts, and then it comes in, faith in Christ. So make sure we don't lean on our own understanding or lean on our abilities or our strength. You're gonna need Jesus to be not, I'm not saying survive 2024, I'm saying thrive 2024. You don't need to just survive. You can thrive too, all right? You can even thrive in those struggles. Thank God for that. And it says this, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. So because he knew that there was gonna be the joy of overcoming all this, he endured the cross. By the way, we know that we're gonna have eternal life, right? After this life, disregarding its shame, now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. Don't lose focus. If Jesus did it, he's given us the ability to do it too to get through this life. Don't get weary or give up. Don't lose your focus. Stay focused on Christ. What's your life focus? I'm, I'm wrapping it up here and we're gonna sing together and worship. And we're also gonna open up the altars if you need to bring something to the Lord or focus in or need prayer for something. What's your life focus? I really thought about that question this week. What do you focus your, your life on, your time, your energy? your heart. And is it, does it involve the kingdom of God? Because you, you have been saved by God and now you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And God is our focus. Jesus is our focus. And then Jesus has things that we can do in his kingdom or for his kingdom. Can you put on kingdom lenses in your occupation? Yes. Maybe God has placed you in a, in a, in a job or a neighborhood, a community, a family, an Air Force base, a school. I believe God has you there for a purpose and a reason. And to know that reason is so important. And I want to encourage you that you got to focus on certain things. Yes, there's things to do in this life. But God has a certain focus in his kingdom for you too. And he's so excited to get you involved in it. And you know what? Don't overlook the, the mundane, everyday things. Those are important too. Amen. If you could simplify your focus, this is what I recommend. A lot of people you know, may wonder, what am I supposed to do in this Christian life? What's next? What's my focus? You ready for this? Simplify it like this. Focus on loving God. And I mean loving God first and foremost. Seeking first his kingdom, loving him, obeying him, being in fellowship with him, abiding with him, learning who he is, his heart. Okay, secondly, love those closest to you, like family members and close friends. Loving one another in the church, in the body of Christ. 
and then reaching out in love to the lost and to those outside the church. I mean, wouldn't that take the rest of our life to get that right? Am I right? That would take the rest of our life to get that right. And yet we're focused on so many other things and not focused on that. Like maybe we should just focus on this one point this year to love God in greater measure, to love those closest to us better. That is a noble thing to do. To, to love one another in the body of Christ, not hurt each other, to lift each other up, encourage one another, and then reach out in love to the lost and love those who are lost. Love sinners like Christ loves sinners, amen? amen? That could be your simple focus this year. I don't know. I mean, I'm hoping and praying that today's message is stimulating and stirring up ideas for you on what you can focus on this year. But these are five prayers I'm praying and I'll be adding to this prayer list for us. Sound good? Let me stand together. These altars are open now. Altar me in front here. You can create one where you are if you want. Talking to God here for a moment. When we were worshiping, that, that point about not doing life on my own strength really was highlighted in me. Don't, don't, try to, don't try to do anything on your own strength without Jesus. It's not gonna work. Trust him, go to him, give those things to him. So if you need to do that right now, these altars are open. You know why these volunteers are here? They're here to lead you to Christ if you need salvation. You wanna start your year off trusting in Jesus for salvation. They're here to pray with you. You need prayer about something you're having to trust God on. They're here to pray with you. Or you can just come in and not be prayed for and just be by yourself with God. So these, these altars are open. We're gonna sing a song called Jesus at the Center. All these points, Jesus was the center of it all. I pray that this will be our hearts this year. May we know our purpose this year. May we abide. And we know our purpose by abiding in fellowship with him. May we learn to trust him. May we depend on the Lord and, and may we be bold in our faith. And may we focus. If we need to refocus today, let it be. We focus in on him as the center of our lives. A quick uh, couple housekeeping points I just want to share with you before we go. One, our groups are starting up here in the next couple weeks. Some are starting this week. Some are starting next week. We have some new groups. We even have some out in the lobby today. We have the um, marriage retreat as well out there. Uh, keep an eye on our website for these groups so you can grow closer to God and, and fellowship with other people and learn. And um, secondly, when COVID hit, we didn't pass the offering plate uh, for just not passing germs around on a bag and stuff like that. And it's worked out. It's actually been okay. You guys have been faithful to give as you leave or give online. But just something from a pastor's heart, I want us to keep in mind when we're giving is that giving to the Lord is also an act of worship. Would you agree? Because it's an act of obedience to the Lord. And the Bible says to honor God with our wealth in Proverbs 3 verse 9. I won't turn to it right now, but if you want to check me out on that, you can. Proverbs 3, verse 9. As I was reading Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 about trusting the Lord, he talks about money. And he says, if you will honor me with your wealth, I will fill your store places even more. And I'm paraphrasing. And, um, and there's many ways to honor God with your wealth. It's even how you spend it, how you steward it. It's not just giving to the church. And uh, so I just, I just want to encourage you, with, though, with this. My point is this that when you give online this week or when you have it automated, remember to pray over it, you know? Remember to say, Lord, this is yours. If you're giving on your way out at our boxes or ushers, just kind of, you know, whisper in your heart and your mind, God, I'm giving this to you. This is my act of trust and obedience with my finances. And most of all, I'm wanting your kingdom to advance. I'm wanting your kingdom to spread with these gifts and these offerings. So let's, let's not lose the worship in our giving because we do it automatically or uh, because we do it at the end and it's like an afterthought. I believe God wants us to worship him in our giving too, yes. according to scripture. He talks about trusting him, stepping out in faith and doing as he says. So thank you for your giving and um, 
I just wanna just pray over that to be more intentional with it too. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for your word today, Lord. And we thank you for the book of Acts, God, how we're gonna learn so much starting next week again. I just pray you prepare our hearts for that. Lord, I pray you would do some work in our hearts today with this message, Lord. And God, uh, we thank you for what you provided in our lives. We thank you, God, that you are trustworthy and you're taking care of all of our needs, Lord. And so, God, we give back to you in obedience and trust to you, Lord, to do your kingdom work here on earth. God, we give a lot of money or spend a lot of money on different things. But, Lord, this money is meant to bring even more people into the kingdom. This money is meant to store up treasures in heaven, not on earth. And so, God, we pray you take it and multiply it and use it for your glory. Thank you, God, for the stewardship of this body, the stewardship of the leadership. Lord, thank you for our board, Lord, who helps us make those decisions, God. And I pray, Lord, that we would have an amazing day, an amazing week in you. Draw us closer to you, Lord. We give you all the glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.